the husband has the right to take back his divorced wife during the Idda waiting period. Allah said, and their husbands have the better right to take them back in that period if they wish for reconciliation. Hence, the husband who divorces his wife can take her back, providing she is still in her idda, time spent before a divorced woman or a widow can remarry, and that, <coughs> and that his aim by taking her back is righteous and for the purpose of bringing things back to normal. However, this ruling applies where the husband is eligible to take his divorced wife back. We should mention that when this ayah 228 was revealed, the ruling that made the divorce thrice and specified when the husband is ineligible to take his divorced wife back had not been revealed yet. Previously, the man used to divorce his wife and then take her back even if he had divorced her a hundred separate times. Thereafter, Allah revealed the following ayah 2.29 that made the divorce only thrice. So there was now a reversible divorce and an irreversible final divorce. The rights the spouses have over each other. Allah said, and they, women, have rights over their husbands as regards living expenses, similar to those of their husbands, over them as regards obedience and respect to what is reasonable. This ayah indicates that the, that the wife has certain rights on her husband, just as he has certain rights on her, and each is obliged to give the other spouse his due rights. Muslim reported that Jabir said that Allah's Messenger said, Fear Allah regarding your woman, for you have taken them by Allah's covenant and were allowed to enjoy with them sexually by Allah's words. You have the rights you have the right on them that they do not allow anyone you dislike to sit on your mat. If they do that, then discipline them leniently. They have the right to be spent on and to be bought clothes in what is reasonable. Abbas bin Hakim said that Muawiyah bin Haida al Kushairi related that his grandfather said, O Messenger of Allah, what is the right the wife of one of us has? The Prophet said to feed her when you eat, buy her clothes when you buy for yourself, and to refrain from striking her on the face, cursing her or staying away from her except in the house. Waqi relate, related that Ibn Abbas said, I like to take care of my appearance for my wife, just as I like for her to take care of her appearance for me. This is because Allah says, and they women have rights similar to those of their husbands over them to what is reasonable. This statement is reported by Ibn Jarir and Ibn Abu Hatim. The virtue men have over women. <coughs> the virtue men have over women. Allah said, but men have a degree of responsibility over them. This ayah in indicates that men are in a more advantage are in a more advantageous position than women physically as well as in their mannerism, status, obedience of women to them, spending, taking care of the affairs and in general, in this life and in the hereafter, Allah said in another ayah. Men are the protectors and maintainers of women because Allah has made one of them to excel the other and because they spend to support them 
from their means 434 Allah's statement and Allah is almighty all wise means he is mighty in his punishment of those who disobey and defy his commands he is wise in what in what he commands destines and legislates 229 the divorce is twice after that either you retain her on reasonable terms or release her with kindness and it is not lawful for you men to take back from your wives any of what you gave them the mod bridal money given by the husband to his wife at the time of marriage except when both parties fear that they would be unable to keep the limits ordained by Allah e.g. to deal with each other on a fair basis then if you fear that they would not be able to keep the limits ordained by Allah that there is no sin on either of them if she gives back the mud or a part of it these are the limits ordained by Allah so so do not transgress them and whoever transgresses the limits ordained by Allah then such are the wrongdoers 230 and if he has divorced her the third time then she is not lawful unto him thereafter until she has married another husband then if the other husband divorces her it is no sin on both of them that they reunite provided they feel that they can keep the limits ordained by Allah these are the limits of Allah which he makes plain for the people who have knowledge divorce is thrice this honorable ayah ab abrogated the previous practice in the beginning of Islam when the man had the right to take back his divorced wife even if he had divorced her a hundred times as long as she was still in her idda waiting period this situation was harmful for the wife and this is why Allah made the divorce thrice where the husband is allowed to take back his wife after the first and the second divorce as long as she is still in her idda the divorce becomes irrevocable after the third divorce as Allah said <coughs> the divorce is twice after that either you retain her on reasonable terms or release her with kindness in his sunan Abu Dawud reported in chapter taking the wife back after the third divorce is an abrogated practice that Ibn Abbas commented on the ayah and divorced women shall wait as regards their marriage for free menstrual periods and it is not lawful for them to conceal what Allah has created in their wombs 2 228 the man used to have the right to take back his wife even if he had divorced her thrice Allah abrogated this and said The divorce is twice. This hadith was also collected by Al Nasai. Ibn Abu Hatim reported that Uriva said that a man said to his wife, I will neither divorce you nor take you back. She said, <coughs> How? He said, I will divorce you, and when your term of Ida nears its end, I will take you back. She went to Allah's Messenger and told him what happened, and Allah revealed. The divorce is twice. Ibn Jarir at Tabari also reported this hadith in his tafsir. Allah said, <coughs> After that, either you retain her on reasonable terms or release her with kindness. Meaning, if you divorce her once or twice, you have the choice to take her back. As long as she is still in her idda, intending to be kind to her and to mend differences. Otherwise, await the end of her term of idda when the divorce becomes final and let her go her own way in peace without committing any harm or injustice against her Ali bin Abu Tala reported that Ibn Abbas said when the man divorces his wife twice let him fear Allah regarding the third time he should either keep her with him and treat her with kindness or let her go her own way with kindness without infringing upon any of her rights 
taking back the mod dowry. Allah said, And it is not lawful for you men to take back from your wives any of the dowry what you gave them, meaning you are not allowed to bother or pressure your wives to end this situation by giving your by giving you back the mod and any gifts that you have given them in return for divorce. Similarly, Allah said, and you should not treat them with harshness that you may take away part of what you have given them unless they commit open illegal sexual intercourse. 419. However, if the wife willingly gives back anything with a good heart then Allah said regarding the situation, but if they of their own good pleasure remit any part of it to you, take it and enjoy it without fear of any harm. For for. Allowing cool and the return of the mod in that case. When the spouses have irreconcilable differences wherein the wife ignores the rights of the husband, dislikes him and becomes unable to live with him any longer, she is allowed to free herself from married life by giving him back what he had given her in gifts and mod. There is no sin on her in this case nor on him if he accepts such offers. This is why Allah said, And it is not lawful for you men to take back from your wives any of what you gave them, except when both parties fear that they would be unable to keep the limits ordained by Allah, e.g. to deal with each other on a fair basis. Then if you fear that they would not be able to keep the limits ordained by Allah, then there is no sin on either of them if she gives back. Sometimes the woman has no valid reason and she still asks for her marriage to be ended. In this case, Ibn Jari reported that Favban said that Allah's Messenger said, Any woman who asks her husband for divorce without justification, then the scent of paradise will be forbidden for her. Al Tirmidhi recorded this hadith and stated that it is Hassan. Ibn Jari said that the ayah to 229 was revealed about Fawit bin Qais bin Shamas and his wife Habiba bint Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul in his Muwatta. Imam Malik reported that Habiba bint Sal al Ansariya was married to Fawit bin Qais bin Shamas and that Allah's Messenger once went to the Fajr dawn prayer and found Habiba bint Sal by his door in the dark. Allah's Messenger said, Who is this? She said, I am Habiba bint Sal, O Messenger of Allah. He said, What is the matter? She said, I and Fawit bin Qais, meaning she can no longer be with her husband, when her husband Fawit bin Qais came. Allah's Messenger said to him, This is Habiba bint Sal. She said what Allah has permitted her to say. Habiba also said, O Messenger of Allah, I still have everything he gave me. Allah's Messenger said, Take it from her. So he took it from her, and she remained in her family's house. This was reported by Ahmad, Abu Dawud, and An Nasai. Al-Bukhari reported that Ibn Abbas said that the wife of Fawit bin Qais bin Shamas came to the Prophet and said O Messenger of Allah, I do not criticize his religion or mannerism, but I hate committing kufr in Islam by ignoring his rights on her. Allah's Messenger said, Will you give him back his garden? She said, Yes. Allah's Messenger said, take back the garden and divorce her once. al Nasai also recorded it. The Idda waiting period for the Kul 
At-Tirmidhi reported that Rubayi, Rubayi bint Muavid bin Afra got a kul during the time of Allah's messenger and the Prophet ordered her to wait for one menstruation period for Idda. Transgressing the set limits of Allah is an injustice. Allah said, These are the limits ordained by Allah, so do not transgress them. And whoever transgresses the limits ordained by Allah, then such are the wrongdoers. This means that the laws that Allah has legislated are his, li are his set limits, so do not transgress them. An authentic hadith states, Allah has set some limits, so do not transgress them, and commanded some commands, so do not ignore them, and made some things unlawful, so do not commit them. He has also left some matters without rulings as a mercy with you, not because he has forgotten them, so, don't, so do not ask about them. Pronouncing free divorces are the same time. Pronouncing free divorces at the same time is unlawful. The last ayah we mentioned was used as evidence to prove that it is not allowed to pronounce free divorces at one time. What further proves this ruling is that Mahmud bin Labid has stated, as An Nasai recorded, that Allah's Messenger was told about a man who pronounced free divorces on his wife at one time. So the Prophet stood up while angry and said, The Book of Allah is being made the subject of jest while I am still amongst you. A man then stood up and said, Should I kill that man, O Messenger of Allah? The wife cannot be taken back after the third divorce. Allah said, And if he has divorced her the third time, then she is not lawful for him thereafter until she has married another husband. This ayah indicates that if the man divorces his wife for the third time after he divorced her twice, then she will no longer be allowed for marriage to him. Allah said, Until she has married another husband, meaning until she legally marries another man. <coughs> For instance, if she has sexual intercourse with any man, even her master, if she was a servant, she would still be ineligible for marriage for her ex-husband who divorced her twice, who had divorced her thrice, because whomever she had sexual relations with was not her legal husband. If she marries a man, <coughs> If she marries a man without consummating the marriage, she will not be eligible for her ex-husband. Ex Muslim reported that Aisha said that Allah's Messenger was asked about a woman who marries a man who thereafter divorces her thrice. She then marries another man and he divorces her before he has sexual relations with her. Would she be allowed for her first husband? Allah's Messenger said, No, until he enjoys her, Usayla, sexual relation. Al Bukhari also reported this hadith. Imam Ahmad recorded that Aisha said, The wife of Rifa al Qurasi came while I and Abu Bakr were with the Prophet, and she said, I was Rifa's wife, but he divorced me, and it was an irrevocable divorce. Then I married Abdur Rahman bin as but his sexual organ is minute like a string. She then took a small string of her garment to resemble how small his sexual organ was. Khalid bin Said bin Al-As, who was next to the door and was not yet allowed in, said, <coughs> O Abu Bakr, why do you not forbid this woman from what she is revealing frankly before the Prophet? The Prophet merely smiled. Then Allah's Messenger asked her, do you want to remarry Rifa? You cannot unless you experience his Usayla and he experiences your Usayla. He yeah, had a complete sexual relation with your present husband. Al Bukhari, Muslim, and An Nasai also recorded this hadith. Muslim's wording is Rifa divorced his wife for the third and final time. The word Usayla. Mentioned in the hadith means sexual intercourse. 
Imam Ahmad and An Nasai reported that Aisha said that Allah's Messenger said, Usayla is sexual intercourse. The curse on the participants of Talil Halala. The reason for the woman who has who was divorced thrice to marry another man must be that the man desires her and has the intention of having an extended married life with her. These are the legal goals and aims behind marriage. If the reason behind the second marriage was to make the woman eligible for for her ex husbands for her ex husband again, then this is the talil that the hadiths have cursed and criticized. In addition, when the reason behind this marriage, if it was talil, is announced in the contract, it would make the contract invalid, according to the majority of the scholars. Imam Ahmad reported that Abdullah bin Masud said, Allah's Messenger cursed the one who does talil, the one in whose favor it is done. Those who eat riba, ushri, and those who feed it, pay the ushri. At Tirmidhi and An Nasi reported this hadith, and At Tirmidhi said, This hadith is Hassan. He said, This is what is acted upon according to people of knowledge among their companions, among whom are Umar, Uthman, and Ibn Umar. It was also the saying of the scholars of fiqh among the Tabi'in, second generation of Islam. And it has been reported from Ali bin uh, Ali ibn Masud, um, Ali ibn Masud and Ibn Abbas. In his Mustadrak, Al Hakim reported that Nafi said, "A man came to Ibn Umar and asked him about a man who divorced his wife three times. Then his brother married her to make talil for his brother, without the brother knowing this fact. He then asked." Is she allowed for the first husband? He said, No, unless it is a marriage that involves desire. We used to consider this an act of adultery during the time of Allah's Messenger. Al Hakim said, This hadith has a Sahih chain. Although they, Al Bukhari and Muslim, did not record it, the wording of this hadith indicates that the ruling came from the Prophet. Abu Bakr bin Abu Shaiba al Jawzani Jawzani Harb al Kirmani and Abu Bakr al Atram said that Kabisa bin Jabir said that Umar said, If the participants to Talil are brought to me, I will have them stoned. When does a woman who was divorced three times become elig eligible for her first husband? <laughs> Allah said, And if he has divorced her, meaning the second husband, after he had complete sexual relations with her, it is no sin on both of them that they reunite, meaning the wife and their first husband, provided they feel that they can keep the limits ordained by Allah meaning they live together honorably. Mujahid said, If they are convinced that the aim behind the marriage is honorable, next Allah said, These are the limits of Allah, His commandments and legislation. He makes plain for the people who have knowledge. 231. And when you have divorced women, and they have fulfilled the term of their prescribed period, either take them back on a reasonable basis or set them free on a, on a reasonable basis. But do not take them back to hurt them, and whoever does that, then he has wronged himself. And treat not the verses laws of Allah in jest, but remember Allah's favors on you, ye yeah, Islam and that which he has sent down to you of the book, yeah, the Quran, and Al-Hikmah, 
the Prophet's Sunnah, legal ways, Islamic jurisprudence, whereby he instructs you and fear Allah and know that Allah is all aware of everything. Being kind to the over, being kind to the divorced wife. This is a command from Allah to men that when one of them divorces his wife with a reversible divorce, he should treat her kindly so when her term of Ida waiting period nears its end, he either takes her back in a way that is better, including having witnesses that he has taken her back, and he lives with her with kindness, or he should release her after her Ida finishes and then kindly asks her to depart from his house without disputing fighting with her or using foul words Allah then said <laughs> but do not take them back to hurt them Ibn Abbas Mujahid Masruk Al Hassan Katala Al Dahak Al Rabi and Mukatil bin Hayyan said that a man used to divorce his wife and when her idda came near its end, he would take her back to harm her and to stop her from marrying someone else. He then divorced her and she would, be, and she would begin her idda. and when her idda term near its end, he would take her back again, so that the term of idda would be prolonged for her. After that, Allah prohibited this practice. Allah, also, Allah has also threatened those who indulge in such practices. When he said, and whoever does that, then he has wronged himself, meaning by defying Allah's commandments, Allah then said, and treat not the verses laws of Allah in jest, in a jest. Ibn Jarir said that Abi Musa al-Ashari narrated that Allah's messenger once became angry at the Ashari tribe. Abi Musa went to him and said, O Messenger of Allah, are you angry with are you angry with the Ashariin? The Prophet said. One of you says, I divorced her, then says I took her back. This is not the appropriate ways this is not the appropriate way Muslims conduct divorce. Divorce the woman when she has fulfilled the term of the prescribed period. Masruk said that the ayah refers to the man who harms his wife by divorcing her and then taking her back so that the idda term is prolonged for her. Al Hassan, Katada, Atta al Kurasani, Al Rabi, and Mukatil bin Hayyan said he is the man who divorces his wife and says, I was joking, or he frees a servant of or he frees a servant or gets married and says, I was only joking, Allah revealed. And treat not the verses laws of Allah in a jest. Then such men were made to bear the consequences of their actions. Allah then said, But remember Allah's favors on you meaning by his sending his messenger with the right guidance and clear signs to you and that which he has sent down to you of the book he had the quran and al hikmah meaning the sunnah whereby he instructs you meaning commands you forbids you and threatens you for transgressing his prohibitions allah said and fear Allah, meaning concerning what you perform and what you avoid. And know that Allah is all aware of everything. None of your secret or public affairs ever escapes his knowledge and he will treat you accordingly. 232. And when you have divorced women and they have fulfilled the term of their prescribed period do not prevent them from marrying their former husbands 
if they mutually agree on reasonable basis. This instruction is an admonition for him among you who believes in Allah and the last day that is more virtuous and purer for you. Allah knows and you know not. The, wall, the Wali guardian of the divorced woman should not prevent her from going back to her husband. Ali bin Abi Talha reported that Ibn Abbas said, This ayah was revealed about the man who divorces his wife once or twice and her idda finishes. He later thinks about taking her back in marriage and the woman also wishes that yet. Her family prevents her from re remarrying him. Hence, Allah prohibited her family from preventing her. Masruk, Ibrahim al Nakai, Asuri, and Al Dahak stated that this is the reason behind revealing the ayah 2 232. These statements clearly conform to the apparent meaning of the ayah. There is no marriage without a wali for the woman. The ayah 2 232 also indicates that the woman is not permitted to give herself in marriage, rather she requires a wali, guardian such as her father, brother, adult son and so forth, to give her away in marriage, as Ibn Jarir and At-Tirmidhi have stated when they mentioned this ayah. Also a hadith states that the woman does not give another woman away for marriage, and the woman does not give herself away in marriage. For only the adulteress gives herself away from marriage. Another hadith states, No marriage is valid except with the participation of a mature wali and two trustworthy witnesses. <laughs> the reason behind revealing the ayah 2-232 it was reported that this ayah was revealed about Makil bin Yassar al Musani, and his sister al Bukhari reported in his Sahih. When he mentioned the tafsir of this ayah 2 232, that the husband of the sister of Makil bin Yassar divorced her, he waited until her idda finished and then asked to remarry her, but Makil refused. Then this ayah was sent down. Do not prevent them from marrying their former husbands. Abu Dawud At-Tirmidhi ibn Abu Hatim, Ibn Jarir and Ibn Marduvia and al Bayhaqi reported this hadith from Al-Hassan from Makil bin Yasar. At-Tirmidhi rendered this hadith authentic and in, in, and in his narration Makil bin Yasar gave his sister in marriage for a Muslim man during the time of Allah's Messenger. She remained with him for a while and he divorced her once and did not take her back until her idda finished. They then wanted to get back with each other and he came to ask her for marriage. Makil said to him, O oh, ungrateful one, I honored you and married her to you, but you divorced her. By Allah, she will never be returned to you. But Allah knew but Allah knew his need for his wife and her need for her husband, and he revealed, And when you have divorced women, and they have fulfilled the term of their prescribed period, until he said, And you know not. Then, uh, when Makil heard the ayah, he said, I hear and obey my lord. He then summoned the man and said, I will honor you and let you remarry my sister. Ibn Marduvia added that Makil said, and will pay the expiation for breaking my vow. Allah said, This instruction is an admonition for him among you who, be among you who believes in Allah and the last day, meaning pro prohibiting you from preventing the woman from marrying their ex-husband if they both agree to it. Among you, O people, who believes in Allah and the last day, meaning believes in Allah's commandments and fears his warnings and the torment in the hereafter, Allah said, that is more virtuous and purer for you. 
meaning obeying Allah's law by returning the woman to their ex-husband and abandoning your displeasure is purer and cleaner for your hearts. Allah knows the benefits you gain from what he commands and what he forbids. And you know not the benefits in what you do or what you refrain from doing. 233. The mothers should suckle their children for two whole years, that is, for those parents who desire to complete the term of suckling, but the father of the child shall bear the cost of the mother's food and clothing on a reasonable basis. No person shall have a burden laid on him greater than he can bear. No mother shall be treated unfairly on account of her child, nor father on account of her nor father on account of his child, and on the father's heir. Is incumbent the like of that which was incumbent on the father, if they both decide on weaning by mutual consent and after due consultation there is no sin on them and if you decide on a foster suckling mother for your children there is no sin on you provided you pay the mother what you agree to give her on a reasonable basis and fear Allah and know that Allah is all seer of what you do The suckling period is only two years. This is a direction from Allah to the mothers to suckle their infants through the, through the complete term of suckling, which is two years. Hence, suckling after two years is not included in this address. Allah said, Who desire to complete the term of suckling? Therefore, the suckling that establishes tarim, prohibition, yet one cannot marry his mother or sister from suckling, is what occurs before the two years end. If the infant is suckled only after two years of age, then no tarim will be established. At-Tirmidhi, under chapter suckling, establishes tarim within the first two years reported that Umm Salama narrated that Allah's messenger said Suckling establishes tarim if it is on the breast and before fitam, before weaning, yet before the end of the first two years. Al-Tirmidhi said, this hadith is Hassan Sahih, the majority of the people of knowledge among the companions of Allah's Messenger and others acted upon this. That is that suckling establishes tarim, prohibition in marriage, before the end of the two years and that whatever occurs after that does not establish tarim. Al-Tirmidhi is alone in recording this hadith and the narrators in its chain meet the criteria of the Sahihain, the Prophet's statement. On the breast refers to the organ of suckling before the two years. Imam Ahmad reported a hadith in which al Bara bin Asib narrated. When Ibrahim, the Prophet's son, died, the Prophet said, My son has died on the breast and he has someone to suckle him in paradise. Furthermore, al daira Kutni related that Ibn Abbas said that Allah's Messenger said, Suckling establishes tarim only within the first two years. Imam Malik reported this hadith from Fawr bin Said, who narrated that Ibn Abbas related it to the Prophet. al daira Wardi reported this hadith from Fawr, who narrated it from Ikrima, who narrated it from Ibn Abbas in this narration, which is more authentic, he added. Whatever occurs after the two years is not considered. 
suckling beyond two, the two years. It is reported in the Sahih that Aisha thought that if a woman gives her milk to an older person, meaning beyond the age of two years, then this will establish tarim. This is also the opinion of Atta bin Abu Raba and Laif bin Sad. Hence, Aisha thought that it is permissible to suckle the man whom the woman needs to be allowed in her house. She used as evidence the hadith of Salim, the freed slave of Abu Hudayfa, where the Prophet ordered Abu Hudayfa's wife to give some of her milk to Salim. Although he was a man and ever since then he used to enter her house freely. However, the rest of the Prophet's wives did not agree with this opinion and thought that this was only a special case. This is also the opinion of the majority of the scholars. <laughs> Suckling for monetary compensation Allah said, But the father of the child shall bear the cost of the mother's food and clothing on a reasonable basis. Meaning, the father of the baby is obliged to provide for the expenses of the mother and to buy her clothes is reasonab in reasonable amounts, usually used by similar women in that area, without extra wages or stinginess. The father spends within his means in this case. Allah said in another ayah, let the rich man spend according to his means and the man whose resources are restricted. Let him spend according to what Allah has given him. Allah puts no burden on any person beyond what he has given him. Allah will grant after hardship ease. 65 7. Al Dahak commented If the husband divorces his wife with whom he has with whom he had a child and she suckles that child, he is required to provide for the mother's expenses and clothes within reason. No darar harm or dirad revenge, Allah said. No mother shall be treated unfairly on account of her child, meaning the mother should not decline to rear her child to harm its father. The mother does not have the right to, re to refrain from suckling the child after giving birth, unless she suckles him or unless she suckles him, her, the milk that is necessary. For his her survival later on she is allowed to give up custody of the child as long as she does not do that intending to, to harm the father in addition the father is not allowed to take the child from his from his mother to harm the mother this is why Allah said nor father on account of his child, meaning by taking the child from his mother, intending to harm the mother. This is the tafsir of Mujahid, Katala, al dahak As-Suri, As-Sudi, At-Favri, and Ibn Said, and others on this ayah. Allah then said, And on the father's heir is incubant the like of that which was incubant on the father. Meaning, by refraining from harming the relative of the father, yet his infant, as Mujahid, Ashabi, and Ad Dahak stated, it was also reported that the ayah requires the inheritor of the father to spend on the mother of the child, just as the father was spending, and to preserve her rights and refrain from harming her. According to the tafsir of the majority of the scholars, we should state that Ibn Jarir has explained this subject in detail in his tafsir and that he ha also stated that suckling the child after the second year might harm the child's body and mind. Sufyan at Favri narrated that Al Kama asked a woman who was suckling her child after the second year ended, 
not to do that. Fitam weaning occurs by mutual consent. Allah said, If they both decide on weaning by mutual consent and after due consultation, there is no sin on them. This ayah indicates that if the father and the mother decide on the fitam weaning before the two years of suckling end, and for a benefit that they duly discuss and agree upon, then there is no sin in this case. So the ayah indicates that one parent is not allowed to take to make this kind of decision without duly consulting the other parent, as stated by At Favri. <laughs> the, met the method of mutual consultation protects the child's interests. It is also a mercy from Allah to his servants, for he has legislated the best method for parents to rear their children, and his legislation guides and directs their parents and the children to success. Similarly, Allah said in Surat at talaq chapter 65 in the Quran, Then if they give suck to the children for you, give them their due payment, and let each of you accept the advice of the other in a just way. But if you make difficulties for one another, then some other woman may give suck for him, the father of the child, 65, 6. Allah then said, <laughs> And if you decide on a foster suckling mother for your children, there is no sin on you, provided you pay the mother what you agreed to give her on a reasonable basis. Meaning, if the mother and the father both agree that the father assumes custody of the child due to a circumstance that compels her or allows him to do so, then there is no sin in this case. Hence, the mother is allowed to give up the child, and the father is allowed to assume custody of the child. The father should kindly give the mother her expenses for the previous period during which she reared and suckled the child, and he should seek other women to suckle his child for monetary compensation. Thereafter, Allah said, And fear Allah, meaning in all of your affairs, and know that Allah is all seer of what you do, meaning none of your affairs or speech escapes his perfect watch. 234. And those of you who die and leave wives behind them, they, the wives, shall wait as regards their marriage for four months and ten days. Then, when they have fulfilled their term, there is no sin on you if they, the wives, dispose of themselves in a just and honorable manner. Yet yeah, they can marry, and Allah is well acquaint acquainted with what you do. The Idda waiting period of the widow. This ayah contains a command from Allah to the wives whose husbands die, that they should observe a period of Idda of four months and ten nights including the cases where the marriage was consummated or otherwise, according to the consensus of the scholars. <laughs> the proof that this ruling includes the case where the marriage was not consummated is included in the general meaning of the ayah. In a narration recorded by Imam Ahmad and the compilers of the Sunan, which At-Tirmidhi graded Sahih, Ibn Masud was asked about a man who married a woman, but he died before consummating the marriage. He also did not appoint a mod dowry for her. They kept asking Ibn Masud about this subject until he said, I shall give you my own opinion, and if it is correct, then it is from Allah. While if it is, while if it is wrong, it is because of... Uh, my error, and because of the evil efforts of Satan. In this case, Allah and his messenger are innocent of my opinion. She has her full mod. In another narration, 
Ibn Masud said she has a similar mal to that of the woman of her status without stinginess or extravagance. He then continued, she has to spend the idda and has a right to the inheritance. Makil bin Yasar Ashjai then stood up and said, I heard Allah's messenger issue a similar judgment for the benefit of Barva bint Vashik. Abdullah bin Masud became very delighted upon hearing this statement. In another narration, several men from Ashja tribe stood up and said, We testify that Allah's messenger issued a similar ruling for the benefit of Barva bint Vashik. As for the case of the widow whose husband dies while she is pregnant, her term for, of Idda ends when she gives birth, even if, that, even if it occurs an instant after her husband dies. This ruling is taken from Allah's statement. And for those who are pregnant, their idda is until they lay down their burden. 65 4. There is also a hadith from Subay, Subaya al Aslamiya in the two Sahis. Through various chains of narration, her husband, Saad bin Kavla, died while she was pregnant and she gave birth only a few nights after his death. When she finished her nifas, postnatal period, she beautified herself for those who might seek to engage her for marriage. Then Abu Sanabil bin Bakak came to her and said, Why do I see you beautified yourself? Do you wish to marry by Allah? You will not marry until the four months and ten nights have passed. Subeya said, when he said, to, when he said that to me, I collected my garments when night fell and went to Allah's messenger, messenger and asked him about this matter. He said that my idda had finished when I gave birth and allowed me to get married if I wished. <clears throat> the wisdom behind legislating the idda. Sayyid bin Musayib and Abu al Aliyah stated that the wisdom behind making the idda of the widow for months and ten, day, and ten nights is that the womb might contain a fetus. When a woman <coughs> waits for this period, it will become evident if she is pregnant. Similarly, there is a hadith in the two Sahis narrated by Ibn Masud stating. The creation of a human being is put together in the womb of his mother in 40 days in the form of a seed and next he becomes a cloth of thick blood for a similar period and next a morsel of flesh for a similar period. Then Allah, sen then Allah sends an angel who is ordered to breathe life unto the fetus. So these are 4 months and 10 more days to be sure. As some months are less than 30 days, and the fetus will then start to show signs of life after the soul has been breathed into it, Allah knows best. <laughs> the Idda of the slave mother whose master dies. We should state here that the Idda of the slave mother is the same in the case of death as the Idda of the free woman. Imam Ahmad reported that Ahmed bin al Asa Ahmed bin Imam Ahmad reported that Ahmed bin al-As said, Do not confuse the sunnah of our Prophet for us. The idda of the mother, who is also a servant when her master dies, is four months and ten nights. Mourning is required during the idda of death. Allah said, Then when they have fulfilled their term, there is no sin on you if they, the wives, dispose of themselves in a just and honorable manner, yet they can marry. And Allah is well acquainted with what you do. This ayah indicates that mourning for the dead husband is required until the idda is finished. It is also reported in the two sahis that Um Habiba and Zainab bin Jash narrated that Allah's messenger said,
It is not lawful for a woman who believes in Allah and the last day to mourn for more than three days for any dead person except her husband, for whom she mourns for four months and ten days. It is reported in the two Sahihs that Ibn Salama said that a woman said, O Messenger of Allah, my daughter's husband died and she is complaining about her eye. Should we admi administer cool in her eye? He said no several times. Upon repeating this question, he then said, <coughs> It is four months and ten nights during the Jahiliya. One of you would mourn for an entire year. Zainab, the daughter of Im Salama, said about the pre Islamic era of, era of ignorance When the woman's husband died, she would go into seclusion and would wear the worst clothes she has. She would refrain from wearing perfume or any adornments until a year passed. She would then come out of seclusion and would be given dung that she would throw. Then an animal would be brought out, a donkey, a sheep or a bird. Then some blood would be drained from it, usually, <coughs> usually resulting in its, in its death. <coughs> in short, the mourning required from a wife whose husband dies includes not using beautification aids such as wearing perfume and the clothes and jewelry that encourages the men to seek marriage from the woman. All widows must observe this period of mourning whether they are young, old, free, servant, Muslim or disbeliever. <coughs> As the general meaning of the ayah indicates, Allah also said, Then when they have fulfilled their term, meaning when the Idda finishes, according to al Haq and Arabi bin Anas. There is no sin on you, Asuri said, meaning her Vali guardian. If they, the wives, dispose, meaning the woman whose Idda has finished, al Avfi said that Ibn Abbas said, if the woman is divorced or if her husband dies and then her idda term ends, there is no sin that she beautifies herself so that she becomes ready for marriage pr proposals. This is the way that is just and honorable. It was reported that Mukatil bin Hayyan gave the same explanation. Ibn Juraj related that Mujahid said, There is no sin on you if they, the wives, dispose of themselves in a just and honorable manner. Refers to a loud and pure honorable marriage. It was also reported that Al Hassan, As Suri, and As Sudi said the same. 235. And there is no sin on you. If you make a hint of befrotal or conceal it in yourself. Allah knows that you will remember them, but do not make a promise of contract with them in secret, except that you speak on you speak an honorable saying, and do not be determined on the marriage bond until the term prescribed is fulfilled. And know that Allah knows what is in your minds. So fear Him and know that Allah is of forgiving, most forbearing. <laughs> Mentioning marriage indirectly during the Idda, Allah said, And there is no sin on you meaning to indirectly mention marriage to the widow during the term of Ida for her deceased husband. at Favri, Shuba and Jarir stated that Ibn Abbas said, And there is no sin on you if you make a hint of befrotal, means saying, I want to marry and I am looking for a woman whose qualities are such and such, thus talking to her in general terms, in a way that is better. In another narration by Ibn Abbas, saying, I wish that Allah endows me with a wife, 
but he should not make a direct marriage proposal. Al-Bukhari reported that Ibn Abbas said that the ayah. And there is no sin on you if you make a hint of befrotal means the man could say I wish to marry I desire a wife or I wish I could find a good wife Mujahid Tavis Ikrima Said bin Jubair Ibrahim al Nakai Ashabi al Hassan Katada Asuri Yasid bin Qusayt Mukatil bin Hayyan and Al Qasim bin Muhammad and several others among the Salaf and the Imams said that one is allowed to mention marriage indirectly to the woman whose husband died. It is also allowed to indirectly mention marriage to a woman who had gone through final irrevocable divorce. The Prophet ordered Fatima bint Qais to remain in the house of Ibn Umm Maktum for Idda when her husband Abu Amr bin Hafs divorced her for the third time. He said to her, Inform me when your Idda terms end when your Idda term ends. When she finished the Idda, Usama bin Said, the Prophet's freed slave, asked to marry her, and the Prophet married her to him, as for the divorced wife, not irrevocably divorced. There is no disagreement that it is not allowed for other than her husband to mention marriage proposals to her directly or indirectly before the Idda finishes. Allah knows best. Allah said, Or conceal it in yourself, meaning if you hide the intention of seeking marriage with them. Similarly, Allah said, And your Lord knows what their breasts conceal and what they reveal 28.69 and while I am all aware of what you conceal and what you reveal 61 so Allah said here Allah knows that you will remember them meaning in your hearts so he made it easy for you Allah then said but do not make a promise of contract with them in secret Ali bin Abu Tala reported that Ibn Abbas said that but do not make a promise of contract with them in secret means do not say to her I am in love with you or promise me you will not marry someone else after the Idda finishes and so forth. Said bin Jubaid, Ashabi, Ikrima, Abu Abduha, Abdahak, Asuri, Mujahid and At-Favri said that it mean said that it meaning of the ayah means taking the woman's promise not to marry someone else afterwards Allah said except that you speak an honorable saying Ibn Abbas Mujahid Said bin Jubair Asudi at Favri and Ibn Said said that the ayah means to the, to indirectly refer to marriage such as saying I desire some someone I desire someone like you Muhammad bin Sidin said I asked Ubaidah about the meaning of Allah's statement. Except that you speak an honorable saying, he said, he says to her Wali, do not give her away in marriage until you inform me first. This statement was narrated by Ibn Abu Hatim. Allah then said, And do not be determined on the marriage bond until the term prescribed is fulfilled. Meaning, do not make marriage contracts before the Idda finishes. Ibn Abbas, Mujahid, Ashabi, Qatada, Arabi bin Anas, Abu Malik, Said bin Aslam, Mukatil bin Hayyan, Asuri, Atta al Qurasani, Asudi, At Favri, and Ad Dahak said that. Until the term prescribed is fulfilled means do not consummate the marriage before the Idda term finishes. The scholars agree that marriage contracts during the Idda are invalid, Allah then said. And know that Allah knows what is in your minds, so fear him, warning the men against the ideas 
they conceal in their hearts. That they conceal, warning the men against the ideas they conceal in their hearts about women, directing them to think good about them rather than the evil, and Allah will not let them despair of His mercy, as He said, and know that Allah is of forgiving, most forbearing. 236. There is no sin on you if you divorce women while yet you have not touched them, nor appointed for them their due davri, but give them a mutta, a suitable gift, the rich according to his means, and the poor according to his means. A gift of reasonable amount is a duty on the doers of good. <laughs> divorce before consummated the marriage. Allah allowed divorce after the marriage contract and before consummating the marriage. Ibn Abbas, Tavus, Ibrahim and Al-Hassan al-Basri said that touched mentioned in the ayah means sexual intercourse. The husband is allowed to divorce his wife before consummating the marriage or giving the dawri if it was deferred. 'ta gift at the time of divorce Allah commands the husband to give the wife whom he divorces before consummating the marriage a gift of a reasonable amount the rich according to his means and the poor according to his means to compensate her for her loss al Bukhari reported in his Sahih that Sal bin Saad and Abu Usaid said that Allah's Messenger married Umayma bin Sharahil. When she was brought to the Prophet, he extended his hand to her, but she did not like that. The Prophet then ordered Abu Usaid to provide provisions for her, along with a gift of two garments. 237. And if you divorce them before you have touched, had, had a sexual relation with them, and you have appointed for them their due dawri, then pay half of that, unless they, the woman, agree to remit it. Or he, the husband, in whose hands is the marriage tie, agrees to remit it, and to remit it, and to remit is nearer to attaqwa, piety, righteousness, and do not forget liber liberality between yourselves. Truly, Allah is all seer of what you do. The wife gets half of her mod if she is divorced before the marriage is consummated. This honorable ayah is not a continuation of the mutta gift that was mentioned in the previous ayah. Yeah, divorce before the marriage is consummated. This ayah 2 237 requires the husband to relinquish half of the appointed mod if he divorces his wife before the marriage is consummated. If it was discussing any other type of gift, then it would have been mentioned that way. Especially when this ayah follows the previous ayah related to this subject, Allah knows best. Giving away half of the bridal money in this case is the agreed practice according to the scholars. So the husband pays half of the appointed mod. If he divorces his wife before consummated the marriage, Allah then said, unless they, the woman, agree to remit it, meaning the wife forfeits the dowry and relieves the husband from further financial responsibility. As-Sudi said that Abu Salih mentioned that Ibn Abbas commented on Allah's statement. Unless they, the woman, agrees to remit it, unless the wife forfeits her right. Furthermore, Imam Abu Muhammad bin Abu Hatim said that it was reported that Shurey, Sayyid bin Musayib, Ikrima, Mujahid, Ashabi, Al Hassan, Nafi, Katada, Jabi bin Said, Atta al Kurasani, Addahak, Asuri, Mukatil bin Hayyan, Ibn Sirin, Arabi bin Anas, and Asudi said similarly. Allah then said,
or he, the husband, in whose hands is the marriage tie, agrees to remit it. Ibn Abu Hatim reported that Ahmed bin Shuaib said that his grandfather narrated that the, the Prophet said, The husband is he who has the marriage tie. Ibn Marduvia also reported this hadith, and it is the view chosen by Ibn Jarir. The hadith states that the husband is the person who really holds the marriage tie in his hand, as it is up to him to go on with the marriage with the marriage or end it. On the other hand, the vali of the wife is not allowed to give away any of her rightful dues without her permission, especially the dowry. Allah then states, and to remit it is near to al taqwa piety, righteousness. Ibn Jarir said, some scholars said that this statement is directed at both men and women. Ibn Abbas said, and to remit it is nearer to at taqwa Piety, righteousness indicates that the one who forgives is nearer to at taqwa Piety, a similar statement was made by Ashabi and several other scholars. Mujahid, an nakai Ad-Dahak, Mukatil bin Hayam, Ar-Rabi bin Anas, and Favri stated that liberality mentioned in the ayah refers to the woman giving away her half mar or the man giving away the full mar. This is why Allah said here. And do not forget liberality between yourselves, meaning kindness or generosity, as, as Said has stated. Allah said. <laughs> Truly, Allah is all seer of what you do, meaning none of your affairs ever escapes his perfect watch, and he will reward each according to his deeds. 238. Guard strictly five obligatory as-salawat, the prayers, especially the middle salah, and stand before Allah with obedience. 239. And if you fear an enemy, perform salah, on foot or riding, and when you are in safety, then remember Allah, pray in the manner he has taught you, which you knew not before. Allah commands that the prayer should be performed properly and on time. It is reported in the two sahihs that Ibn Masud said, I asked the Prophet which deed is the dearest to Allah, he replied, to offer the prayers at their fixed times. I asked, what is the next in goodness? He replied, to partic participate in jihad, religious fighting, in Allah's cause. I, I, I again asked, what is the next in goodness? He replied, to be good and dutiful to your parents. Abdullah then added, the Prophet told me these words, and had I asked more, the Prophet would have told me more. The middle prayer. Furthermore, Allah spe has specifically mentioned the middle prayer, which is the Asr prayer, according to the majority of the scholars among the companions, as At-Tirmidhi and Al-Baghavi have stated. Al-Qadi Al-Mawardi added that the majority of the scholars of the Tabi'in also held this view. Al-Hafiz Abu Umar bin Abdul Bad said that this is also the opinion of the majority of the scholars of the Atar Afar. Yeah, the hadith and the statements of the Salaf. In addition, Abu Muhammad bin Atiyah said that this is the tafsir of the middle prayer of the majority of scholars. Al Hafiz Abu Muhammad Abdul Mumin bin Kalaf ad Dumyati. Uh, stated in his book on the middle prayer that it is the Asr prayer and mentioned that this is the tafsir of Umar, Ali, Ibn Masud, Abu Ayyub, Abdullah bin Amr, Samura bin Jindub, Abu Huraira, Abu Said, Hafsa, Um Habiba, Um Salama, Ibn Abbas and Aisha. This is also the tafsir of Ubaidah. Ibrahim al Nakai, Rasin, Sir bin Hubeis, Said bin Jubair, Ibn Sirin, Al Hassan, Katala, Al Dahak, Al Kalbi, Mukatil, 
Ubaid bin Abu Mariam and others. The proof that the Asr prayer is the middle prayer. Imam Ahmad reported that Ali narrated that Allah's messenger said during the battle of Al-Asab, the confederates, they, the disbelievers, visit us from performing the middle prayer, the Ar, the Ar prayer, may Allah fill their hearts and houses with fire. He performed the Asr prayer between Maghrib and Isha. Muslim and an nasai recorded this hadith. In addition, the two shaykhs, Abu Dawud, Al-Tirmidhi, an nasai and several other collectors of the Sunan recorded this hadith using different chains of narrators to Ali. The hadith about the battle of Al-Asab when the mushriks prevented Allah's messenger and his companions from performing the Asr prayer has been narrated by several other companions. We only mentioned the narrations that stated that the middle prayer is the Asr prayer. Furthermore, Muslim reported similar wordings for this hadith from Ibn Masud and Al Bara bin Asib. In addition, Imam Ahmad reported that Samura bin Jundib said that Allah's Messenger said, The middle prayer is the Asr prayer. In another narration, Allah's Messenger mentioned, Guard strictly five obligatory as salavat, the prayers, especially the middle salah, and stated that it is the Asr prayer. In another narration, Allah's Messenger said, It is the Asr prayer, and Ibn Jafar mentioned that the Prophet was then being asked about the middle prayer. At Tirmidhi reported this hadith and said, Hassan Sahih. In addition, Abu Hatim bin Hiban reported in his Sahih that Abdullah said that Allah's Messenger said, The middle prayer is the Asr prayer. Al Tirmidhi reported that Ibn Masud narrated that Allah's Messenger said, The Asr prayer is the middle prayer. Al Tirmidhi then stated that this hadith is of a Hassan, Sahih type. Muslim reported the hadith in his Sahih, and its wordings are. They disbelievers visit us from performing the middle prayer, the Asr prayer. These texts emphasize the fact that, that the Asr prayer is the middle prayer. What further proves this fact is that in an authentic hadith, Allah's messenger emphasized the necessity of preserving the Asr prayer when he said, as Ibn Umar narrated, whoever misses the Asr prayer will be like who has lost his family and money. It is reported in the Sahih that Bureyda bin al husayb said that the Prophet said, On a cloudy day, perform the Asr prayer early, for whoever misses the Asr prayer will have his good deeds annulled. The prohibition of speaking during the prayer. Allah said, and stand before Allah with obedience, meaning with humbleness and humility before him yet during the prayer. This command indicates that it is not allowed to speak during the prayer, as speaking contradicts the nature of the prayer. This is why the Prophet refused to answer Ibn Masud when he greeted him while he was praying and said afterwards, the prayer makes one sufficiently busy by the various actions of the body tongue and heart involved during the prayer. Muslim reported that the Prophet said to Mu'awiyah bin Hakam as sulami when he spoke during the prayer. The ordinary speech people indulge in is not appropriate during the prayer. The prayer involves only tasbih, praising Allah, takbir saying Allahu Akbar, yeah Allah is the most great, and remembering Allah. Imam Ahmad reported that Sayyid bin Arkam said one used to address his friend about various affairs during the prayer, then when this ayah was revealed. And stand before Allah with obedience. We were ordered to refrain from speaking, the group yet the hadith collections, except Ibn Majah reported this hadith.
they fear prayer. Allah said, And if you fear an enemy, perform salah on foot or riding. And when you are in safety, then remember Allah, pray, in a manner he has taught you, which you knew not before. After Allah commanded his servants to perform the prayer perfectly and emphasized this commandment, he mentioned a situation where the person might not be able to perform the prayer perfectly during battle and combat. Allah said, And if you fear an enemy, perform salah on foot or riding, meaning pray in the appropriate manner under these circumstances, whether on foot or riding, and whether facing the Qibla or otherwise. Imam Malik reported that Nafi related that Ibn Umar used to describe the fear prayer when he was asked about it and would then add if there is intense heat uh, if there is intense fear pray on foot riding facing the Qibla and otherwise Nafi commented I think that he related that to the Prophet Al-Bukhari and Muslim reported the Hadith Muslim Abu Dawud and An-Nasai Ibn Majah and Ibn Jarir reported that Ibn Abbas said Allah has ordained the prayer by the words of your Prophet four rakah while reciting, two rakah while traveling and one rakah during times of fear. This is also the view of Al-Hassan al-Basri, Qatada, al dahak and others. In addition, Al-Bukhari has entitled a chapter prayer while confronting the forts and facing the enemy. Al-Afsai Al said, if the victory seems near and the Muslims are unable to perform the prayer in a normal manner, they should pray by nodding each by himself. If they are unable to nod, they should delay the prayer until fighting is finished. When they feel safe, they should pray two rakah. If they are unable, they should then pray one rakah, that includes two prostrations. If they are unable, then takbir alone does not suffice, so they should delay the prayer until they are safe. This is the same view that Makul held. Anas bin Malik said, I participated in the attack on the fort of Tastar. When the light of dawn started to become clear, suddenly the fighting raged and the Muslims were unable to pray until the light of day spread. We then prayed the dawn prayer with Abu Musa and we became victorious. I would not have been pleased if I were to gain in the life of this world and whatever is in it instead of that prayer. This is the wording of Al-Bukhari. Prayer during the times of peace is performed normally. Allah said, And when you are in safety, then remember Allah, pray meaning perform the prayer as I have commanded you by completing its bowing, prostration, standing, sitting and with the required attention in the heart and supplication, Allah said <laughs> in the manner he has taught you, which you knew not before, meaning just as he has endowed you, guided you and taught you about what benefits you in this life and the hereafter. So thank and remember him. Similarly, Allah said after he mentioned the prayer of fear. But when you are free from danger, perform as -salah. Verily, as the prayer, is enjoined on the believers uh, at fixed hours. 403. We will mention the hadiths about the prayer of fear and its description in Surat An-Nisa while mentioning Allah's statement. When you, O Messenger Muhammad, are among them and lead them in as -salah, the prayer, 402, 240, and those of you who die and leave behind wives should bequeath for their wives a year's maintenance and residence without turning them out. But if they wives leave, there is no sin on you for that which they do of themselves, provided it is honorable, e.g. lawful marriage, and Allah is almighty all wise. 241. And for divorced woman, maintenance should be provided on reasonable scale. This is a duty on al-mutakin, the pious, 
242. Thus Allah makes clear his ayat laws to you in order that you may understand. Ayah 2, 240 was abrogated. The majority of the scholars said that this ayah <coughs> that this ayah 2, 240 was abrogated by the ayah 2, 234. What Allah said they the wives shall wait <coughs> as regard their marriage. For four months and ten days, two two hundred thirty-four. For instance, Al Bukhari reported that Ibn As Subair said, "I said to Uthman bin Affan, and those of you who die, and leave wives behind them, was abrogated by the other ayah, two two hundred thirty-four. Therefore, why did you collect it? Meaning in the Quran, he said, O oh my nephew." I shall not change any part of the Quran from its place. The question that Ibn as Subaid asked Uthman means if the ruling of the ayah 2.240 uh, 2, was abrogated to four months, the, the idda of the widow and referred to 2.234. Then, then what is the wisdom behind including it in the Quran? <coughs> Although its ruling has been abrogated if the ayah 2.240 remains in the Quran after the ayah that abrogated it. 2.234 This might imply that its ruling is still valid. Uthman, the leader of the faithful, answered him by stating that this is a matter of the revelation, which mentioned this ayat in this order. <coughs> Therefore, I shall leave the ayah where I found it in the Quran. Ibn Abu Hatim reported that Ibn Abbas said about what Allah said. And those of you who die and leave behind wives should bequeat for their wives a year's maintenance <coughs> and residence without turning them out. The, wi the widow used to reside and have her provisions provided for her for a year in her deceased husband's house. Later, the ayah that specified the inheritance for 12 abrogated this ayah to 240. And thus, the widow inherits one fourth or one eighth of what her deceased husband leaves behind. <coughs> Ibn Abu Hatim also related that Ali bin Abu Talla stated that Ibn Abbas said When a man died and left behind a widow, she used to remain in this house for a year for her idda, all the while receiving her provisions during this time. Thereafter, Allah revealed this ayah. And those of you who die and leave wives behind them, they, the wives, shall wait as regards their marriage for four months and ten days to 234. So this is the idda of the widow, unless she was pregnant for her idda, then ends when she gives birth. Allah also said, In that which you leave, there, there your wives Share is a fort if you leave no child, but if you leave a child, they get an eight of that which you leave. For twelve. So Allah specified the share of the widow in the inheritance, and there was no need for the will of the nafaka maintenance, which were mentioned in two two hundred forty. <coughs> Ibn Abu Hatim stated that Mujahid. Al Hassan, Ikrima, Katala, Al Dahak, Al Rabi, and Mukatil bin Hayyan said that the ayah 2 240 was abrogated by 4 months and 10 days 2 234. Al Bukhari reported that Mujahid said that <coughs> <coughs> and 
and those of you who die and leave wives behind them. 2 234 used to be the Idda, and the widow had to remain with her deceased husband's family during that period, yeah, four months and ten days. Then Allah revealed. And those of you who die and leave behind wives should bequeath for their wives a year's maintenance and residence <coughs> without turning them out. But if they wives leave, there is no sin on you for that which they do of themselves, provided it is honorable, e.g. lawful marriage. So Allah made the rest of the year, which is seven months and twenty days, as a will and testament for her. Consequently, if she wants, she could use her right in this will and remain in the residence for the rest of the year. <coughs> or, if she wants, she could leave the deceased husband's house after the four months and ten days have passed. This is the meaning of what Allah said. <laughs> Without turning them out. But if they wives leave, there is no sin on you. Therefore, the required term of Ida is still unchanged, refer to 2 234. Atta quoted Ibn Abbas this ayah 2 240 has abrogated the requirement that the widow spends the Ida with his yeah, her deceased husband's family. So she spends her idda wherever she wants. This is the meaning of what Allah said. Without turning them out. Atta also said, if she wants, she spends the idda with his family and resides there according to the will, meaning the rest of the year. If she wants, she is allowed to leave, for Allah said, there is no sin on you for that which they do of themselves. Atta then said, Then the ayah on the inheritance referred to 4.12 came and abrogated the residence. Hence, the widow spends her idda wherever she wants and does not have the right to residence anymore. The statement of Atta and those who held the view that the ayah 2, 240 was abrogated by the ayah on the inheritance 412 is only valid for more than the four months and ten days required in 2, 234. <laughs> However, if they mean that the four months and ten days are not required from the deceased husband's estate, then this opinion is the subject of disagreement among the scholars. As proof, they said. <sighs> as proof, they said that the widow is required to remain in her deceased husband's house for four months and ten days, according to what Malik reported from Sena bint Kab bin Ujra. She said that Faria bint Malik bin Sinan. The sister of Abu Sa'id al Qudri told her that she came to Allah's Messenger asking him to return to her family's residence with Banu Qudra. Her husband had pursued some of his servants who ran away, but when he reached the area of Al Qadim, they killed him. She said, So I asked Allah's Messenger if I should stay with my family in Banu Qudra for my deceased husband did not leave me a residence that he owns or nafaka maintenance Allah's messenger answered in the positive while I was in the room Allah's messenger summoned me or had someone summon me and said What did you say? I repeated the story to him about my deceased husband. He said, Stay at your home until the term reaches its end. So I remained through the Idda term 
for four months and ten days in my deceased husband's house. Thereafter, Uthman bin Affan sent for me during his reign and asked me about this matter and I told him what happened. He made a judgment to the same effect. This hadith was also collected by Abu Dawud, At-Tirmidhi, An-Nasai and Ibn Majah. At-Tirmidhi said Hassan Sahih. The necessity of the Mutta gift at the time of divorce. <laughs> Allah said, and for divorced woman, maintenance should be provided on reasonable scale. This is a duty on al mutakin the pious. Abdur Rahman bin Said bin Aslam said that when Allah's statement, a gift of reasonable amount is a duty on the doers of good, 2 36 was revealed. A man said, if I want, I will be excellent, and if I do not, I will not. Thereafter, Allah revealed this ayah. And for divorced women, maintenance should be should be provided on a reasonable scale. This is a duty on al mutakin the pious, the scholars who ruled the, that the mutta reasonable gift at the time of divorce is required for every divorced woman, whether she had a bridal money appointed for her or not, and whether the marriage was cons consummated or not, relied on this ayah, two twenty forty one when they issued their ruling. This is the view taken on this subject by Sa'id bin Jubaid and several others among the Salaf and also Ibn Jarir, hence Allah's statement. There is no sin on you if you divorce women while yet you have not touched had sexual relation with them, nor appointed for them their due davri, but bestow on them a suitable gift, the rich according to his means, and the poor according to his means. A gift of reasonable amount is a duty on the doers of good. 2. 236 only mentions some specifics of this general ruling. Allah then said, Thus, Allah makes clear his ayat, laws to you, meaning what he allows, forbids, requires, his set limits, his commandments, and his, prohibi and his prohibitions are all explained and made plain and clear for you. He did not leave any matter in general terms. If you needed the specifics, in order that you may understand, meaning understand and comprehend. 243. Did you, O Muhammad, not think of those who went forth from their homes in the thousands, fearing death? Allah said to them, Die, and then he restored them to life. Truly, Allah is full of bounty to mankind, but most men thank not. 244. And fight in the way of Allah, and know that Allah is all hearer, all knower. 245. Who is he that will lend to Allah a goodly loan, so that he may multiply it to him many times? And it is Allah that decreases or increases your provisions, and unto him you shall return. The story of the dead people. Ibn Abu Hatim related that Ibn Abbas said that these people mentioned herein were the residents of a village called Davardan. Ali bin Asim said that they were from Davardan, a village several miles away from Basit in Iraq. In his tafsir, Waki bin Jara said that Ibn Abbas commented. Did you, O Muhammad, not think of those who went forth from their homes in thousands, fearing death, that they were four thousand persons who escaped the plague that broke out in their land? They said, We should go to a land that is free of death. When they reached a certain area, Allah said to them, Die, and they all died. Afterwards, one of the prophets passed by them and supplicated to Allah to resurrect them, and Allah brought them back to life. So Allah stated, 
did you, O Muhammad, not think of those who went forth from, the, from their homes in the thousands, fearing death? Furthermore, several scholars among the Salaf said that these people were the residents of a city during the time of the children of Israel. The weather in their land did not suit them, and an epidemic broke out. They fled their land, fearing death, and took refuge in the wilderness. They later arrived at a fertile valley, and they filled what is between its two sides. Then Allah sent two angels to them, one from the lower side and the other from the upper side of the valley. The angels screamed once and all the people died instantly, just as the death of one man. They were later moved to a different place, where walls and graves were built around them. They all perished and their bodies rotted and disintegrated. Long afterwards, one of the prophets of the children of Israel, whose name was Hiskil, Ezekiel, passed by them and asked Allah to bring them back to life by his hand. Allah accepted his supplication and commanded him to say, O rotted bones, Allah commands you to come together. The bones of every body were brought together. Allah then commanded him to say, O bones, Allah commands you to be covered with flesh, nerves and skin. That also happened while his skill was watching. Allah then commanded him to say, O souls, Allah commands you to return, each to the body that it used to inhabit. They all came back to life, looked around and proclaimed, All praise is due to you, O Allah, and there is no deity worthy of worship except you. Allah brought them back to life after they had perished long ago. Which is, we should state that bringing these people back to life is a clear proof that physical resurrection shall occur on the day of resurrection. This, this is why Allah said, Truly, Allah is full of bounty to mankind, meaning in that he shows them his great signs, sound proofs and clear evidences, yet. But most men thank not, as they do not thank Allah for what he has given them with in their worldly life and religious affairs. The story of the dead people, 2 to 144 above also indicates that no that no caution can ever avert destiny and that there is no refuge from Allah but to Allah himself these people departed from their land fleeing the epidemic and seeking to enjoy a long life what they earned was the opposite of what they sought as death came quickly and instant instantaneously and seized them all there is an there is an authentic hadith that Imam Ahmad reported that Abdullah bin Abbas said that Umar bin al khattab once went to Asham, Syria, when he reached the area of Sarg. He was met by the commanders of the army, Abu Ubaida bin Jada and his com companions. They told him that the plague had broken out in Asham. The Hadith then mentioned that Abdur Rahman bin Av, who was away attending to some of his affairs, came and said, I have knowledge regarding this matter. I heard Allah's Messenger say, If it the plague breaks out in the land that you are in, do not leave that land to escape from it. If you hear about, in, if you hear about it in a land, do not enter it. Umar then thanked Allah and went back. This hadith is also reported in the Sahihain. A bad jihad does not alter destiny. Allah said, and fight in the way of Allah, and know that Allah is all hearer, all knower. This ayah indicates that just as caution do does not alter destiny, a bad jihad will neither bring the, the appointed term closer nor delay it. Rather, destiny and the appointed provisions are fixed and shall never be changed or altered, neither by addition nor deletion. Similarly, Allah said, they are the ones who said about their killed brethren while they themselves sat at home. If only they had listened to us, they would not have been killed. Say, avert death from your own selves if you speak the truth. 368. Allah said, They say, Our Lord, why have you ordained for us fighting 
would that you had granted us respite for a short period. Say, short is the enjoyment of this world, the hereafter is far better for him who fears Allah, and you shall not be dealt with unjustly, even equal to the fatila, a scalish thread in the long slit of a date stone. Wheresoever you may be, death will overtake you, even if you are in the fortresses built up strong and high. 4. 77-78 Abu Sulaiman, Khalid bin al-Walid, the commander of the Muslim armies, the veteran among Muslim soldiers, the protector of Islam, and the sword of Allah that was raised above his enemies, said while dying, I have participated in so and so number of battles. There is not a part of my body but suffered a shot of an arrow, a stab of a spear, or a strike of a sword. Yet, here I am. I die on my bed just as the camel dies. May the eyes of the cowards never taste sleep. He, may Allah be pleased with him, was sorry and in pain because he did not die as a ma was sorry and in pain because he did not die as martyr in battle. He was sad that he had to die on his bed. The good loan and its reward. Allah said, Who is he that will lend to Allah a goodly loan so that he may multiply it to him many times? In this ayah, Allah encourages his, his servants to spend in his cause. Allah mentioned this, this same, Allah mentioned this same ayah in several other parts of his glorious Quran. The hadith that mentions that Allah descends every night down on the nearest heaven to us, when the last third of the night remains, states that Allah says. Who would give a loan to he who is neither poor nor unjust? Allah's statement. He may multiply it to him many times, is similar to his statement. The likeness of those who spend their wealth in the way of Allah is as the likeness of a grain of corn. It grows seventy seven years, and each year has a hundred grains. Allah gives manifold increase to whom he wills, 2, 261. We'll mention this ayah later on. Allah then said, And it is Allah that decreases or increases your provisions, meaning spend in Allah's cause, and do not be anxious. Certainly, Allah is the sustainer who increases or decreases the provisions to whomever he wills among his servants. Allah's wisdom is perfect and, and unto him you shall return on the day of resurrection. 246. Have we not thought about the group of the children of Israel after the time of Musa, when they said to a prophet of theirs, appoint for us a king and we will fight to in Allah's way. He said, would you then refrain from fighting? If fighting was prescribed for you? They said, why should we not fight in Allah's way while we have been driven out of our homes and our children families have been taken as captives but when fighting was ordered for them they turned away all except a few of them and Allah is all aware of the wrongdoers. The story of the Jews who sought a king to be appointed over them. Mujahid said that the prophet mentioned in the ayah 2.246 above in Shamvil, Samuel, Vab bin Munabi said, The children of Israel remained on the straight path for a period of time after Moses. They then innovated in the religion and some of them even worshipped the idols. Yet there were always prophets sent among them who would command them to work righteous deeds refrain from doing evil and who would rule them according to the commands of the Torah. When they Israelites committed the evil that they committed, Allah caused their enemies to overwhelm them and many fatalities fell among them as a consequence. 
Their enemies also captured a great number of them and took over large areas of their land. Earlier, anyone who would fight the Israelites would lose because they had the Torah and the Tabut, which they inherited generation after generation ever since the time of Moses, who spoke to Allah directly. Yet the Israelites kept indulging in misguidance until some king took the Tabut from them during a battle. That king also took possession of the Torah and only a few of the Israelites who memorized it remained. The prophethood halted among their various tribes and only a pregnant woman remained of the offspring of Lavi, Levi, in whom the prophethood still appeared. Her husband had been killed, so the Israelites kept her in a house so that Allah may give her a boy who would be their prophet. The woman also kept invoking Allah to grant her a boy. Allah heard her pleas and gave her a boy whom she called Shamvil, meaning Allah has heard my pleas. Some people said that the boy's name was Shamun, Simeon, which also has a similar meaning. As that boy grew, Allah raised him to be a righteous person. When he reached the age of prophethood, Allah revealed to him and commanded him to call his people to him and to his Tawheed, oneness. Shamvil called the children of Israel to Allah and they asked him to appoint a king over them so that they could fight their enemies under his command. The kingship had also ended among them. Their prophet said to them, What if Allah appoints a king over you? Would you fulfill your vow to fight under his command? They said, Why should we not fight in Allah's way? while we have been driven out of our homes and our children, meaning after our land had been confiscated and our children had been taken from us, Allah said. But when fighting was ordered for them, they turned away, all except a few of them, and Allah is all aware of the wrongdoers, meaning only a few of them kept their promise, but the majority abandoned jihad and Allah has full knowledge of them. 247 And their prophet said to them, Indeed, Allah has appointed Talut Saul as, uh, Saul as a king over you. They said, how can, he be, how can he be a king over you? How can he be a king over us when we are, a, when we are fitter than him for the kingdom? And he has not given and he has not been given enough wealth. He said, Verily, Allah has chosen him above you and has increased him abundantly in knowledge and stature. And Allah grants his kingdom to whom he wills, and Allah is all sufficient for his creatures' needs, all knower. When the Israelites asked their prophet to, add, to appoint a king over them, he appointed Talit, Saul, who was then a soldier. But Talit was not a descendant of the house of kings among them, which was exclusively in the offspring of Yad, Yahuda, Judah. This is why they said, how can he be a king over us? Meaning, how can he be the king for us? When we are fitter than him for the kingdom, and he has not been given enough wealth, they said that Talit was also poor and did not have the wealth that justifies him being king. Some people stated that Talit used to bring water to the people, while others stated that his profession was dyeing skins. The Jews thus disputed with their prophet while they were supposed to obey him and to say good words to him. Their prophet answered, answered them, Verily, Allah has chosen him above you, meaning Allah chose Talit from amongst you while having better knowledge about him. Their prophet stated, I did not choose Talut to be your king on my own, rather Allah has commanded that upon your request further, and has increased him abundantly in knowledge and stature, meaning Talut is more knowledgeable and honorable than you, and stronger and more patient during combat, and has more knowledge of warfare, in short, he has more knowledge and is stronger than you are. The king should have sufficient knowledge. Be fair looking and should have a strong soul and body. He then said, And Allah grants his kingdom to, 
and Allah grants his kingdom to whom he wills meaning Allah alone is the supreme authority who does what he wills and no one can ask him about his actions while they will be asked about their actions by him this is because Allah has perfect knowledge wisdom and kindness with his creation Allah said and Allah is all sufficient for his creatures needs all knower meaning his favor is encompassing and he grants his mercy to whom he wills he also knows those who deserves to be who deserve to be kings and those who do not deserve it 248 and their prophet said to them verily the sign of his kingdom is that there shall come to you at tabut wherein is sakina peace and reassur reassurance from your lord and a remnant of that which musa moses and harun aaron left behind carried by the angels verily in this is a sign for you if you are indeed believers their prophet then proclaimed the sign of the blessings of talut's kingship over you is that allah will give you back the tabut wooden box that has been taken from you allah said wherein is sakina from your lord meaning peace or grace and reassurance abdur rasak stated that katada said wherein is sakina means grace in addition arabi said that sakina means mercy this is also the meaning given by ibn ibn abbas as al alfi narrated Allah then said and a remnant of that which Musa Moses and Harun Aaron left behind Ibn Jarir related that Ibn Abbas said about this ayah and a remnant of that which Musa Moses and Harun Aaron left behind meaning Moses death and the remnants of the tablets this is the same tafsir of Qatada, As-Sudi, Arabi bin Anas, and Ikrima who added, and also the Torah. Abdur Rasak said that he asked at Favri about the meaning of, and a remnant of that which Musa, Moses, and Harun, Aaron left behind. At Favri said, some said that it did, that it contained a pot of manna and the remnants of the tablets while some others said that it contained Moses' staff and two, shoe, and two shoes and referred to 2012. Allah then said, carried by the angels. Ibn Juraj stated that Ibn Abbas said, the angels came down while carrying the tabut between the sky and the earth until they placed it before Talut while the people were watching. As-Sudi said, the tabut was brought to Talut's house so the people believed in the prophethood of Shamun, Simeon, and obeyed Talut. The prophet then said, Verily, in this is a sign for you, testifying to my truth in what I was sent with, my prophethood and my command to you to obey Talut, if you are indeed believers in Allah and the hereafter. 249. Then when Talut set out with the army, he said, Verily, Allah will try you by a river, so whoever drinks thereof, he is not of me, and whoever tastes, tastes it not, he is of me, except him who takes thereof in the hollow of his hand. Yet they drank thereof, all except a few of them, so when he had crossed it, the river, he and those who believed with him, they said, We have no power this day against Jalut, Goliath, and his hosts. But those who knew with certainty that they were going to meet Allah said, How often has a small group overcome a mighty host by Allah's leave? And Allah is with us Sabirin, the patient. Allah states that Talut, the king of the children of Israel, marched forth with his soldiers and the Israelites who obeyed him. His army was of 80,000 then, according to As-Sudi, but Allah knows best. Talit said, 
Verily, Allah will try you, meaning he will test you with a river which flowed between Jordan and Palestine, Ia the, Sh the Sharia river. According to Ibn Abbas and others, he continued. So whoever drinks thereof, he is not of me, meaning shall not accompany me today. And whoever tasteth not, he is of me, except him who takes thereof, in the hollow of his hand, meaning there is no harm in this case. Allah then said, Yet they drank thereof all except a few of them. Ibn Juraj stated that Ibn Abbas commented, Whoever took some of it, the river's water, in the hollow of his hand, quenched his thirst, as for those who drank freely from it, their thirst was not quenched. Ibn Jarir reported that al Bara bin Asib said, We used to say that the companions of Muhammad who accompanied him on the Battle of Badr were more than 310, just as many as the soldiers who crossed the river with Talit. Only those who believed crossed the river with them. Al-Bukhari also reported this. This is why Allah said, So when he had crossed it, the river, he and those who believed with him, they said, We have no power this day against Jalut, Goliath and his hosts. This ayah indicates that the Israelites who remained with, Salu, with, who remained with Saul thought that they were few in the face of their enemy, who were many then. So their knowledgeable scholars strengthened their resolve by stating that Allah's promise is true and that triumph, triumph comes from Allah alone, not from the large numbers or the adequacy of the supplies. They said to them, How often has a small group overcome a mighty host by Allah's leave? And Allah is with us Sabirin, the patient. 250. And when they advanced to meet Jalut, Goliath, and his forces, they invoked our Lord, pour forth on us patience, and set firm our feet and make us victorious over the disbelieving people. 251. So they routed them by Allah's leave, and Davud, David, killed Jalut, Goliath, and Allah gave him Davud, the kingdom, after the death of Talut and Samuel and Al-Hikmah prophethood and taught him of that which he willed. And if Allah did not check one set of people by means of another, the earth would indeed be full of mischief. But Allah is full of bounty to the Alamin, mankind, jinn and all that exists. 252. These are the verses of Allah. We recite them to you, O Muhammad, in truth. And surely you are one of the messengers of Allah, when the faithful party, who were few under the command of Talut, faced their enemies, faced their enemy, who were many under the command of Jalut. They invoked our Lord, pour forth on us patience, meaning send down patience on us from you, and set firm our feet meaning against the enemy and save us from running away and from feebleness and make us victorious over the disbelieving people Allah said so they routed them by Allah's leave meaning they defeated and overwhelmed them by Allah's aid and support then and David killed Jalut Israelite accounts claim that Prophet, da Prophet David killed Goliath with a slingshot that he had which he launched at Goliath, causing his death. Talut promised that whoever killed Jalut would marry his daughter and would share his kingship and authority. He kept his promise. Later, the kingship was transferred to Prophet Davud, in addition to being granted prophethood by Allah. So Allah said, and Allah gave him Davud the kingship that Talut had and and Al-Hikmah that comes with the, with the prophethood, meaning after Shamvil. Allah then said, and taught him of that which he willed, meaning what he willed of the knowledge that he bestowed on Prophet Davud. Next, Allah said, 
And if Allah did not check one set of people by means of another, the earth would indeed be full of mischief. This ayah indicates that if it were not for the fact that Allah checks one set of people with another, such as when Talut and the bravery of Dawud helped the children of Israel against Goliath, then people would have perished. Similarly, Allah said, For had it not been that Allah checks one set of people by means of another, monasteries, churches, synagogues and majids, wherein the name of Allah is mentioned much, would surely have been pulled down. 22.40 Allah then said, But Allah is full of bounty to the Alameen, mankind, jinn and all that exists, meaning by his mercy and favor, he fixes some of them by some other, others. Surely Allah has the wisdom, the supreme authority and the clear proof against his creation in all of his actions and statements. Allah said, These are the verses of Allah. We recite them to you, O Muhammad, in truth. And surely you are one of the messengers of Allah. This ayah states, these ayat verses of Allah, Allah that we have narrated for you in truth conform to the exact manner that these stories have occurred and to the truth that still remain in the divine books that the scholars of the children of Israel have and know. Allah said, O Muhammad, you are one of the messengers of Allah, empathetically stating the truth of his prophethood. 253. Those messengers, we preferred some of them to others. To some of them Allah spoke directly. Others he raised to degrees of honor. And to Isa, the son of Maryam, we gave clear proofs and evidences and supported him with Ru il Qudus Jibril. If Allah had willed, succeeding generations would not have fought against each other and after clear verses of Allah had come to them, but they differed. Some of them believed and others disbelieved. If Allah had willed, they would not have fought against one another. But Allah does what he wills. Allah honored some prophets above others. Allah states that he has honored some prophets to others. For instance, Allah said, And indeed, we have preferred some of the prophets above others, and to Dawud we gave the Sabur, Psalms 1755. In the ayah above, Allah said, Those messengers we preferred some of them to others, to some of them Allah spoke directly, meaning Musa and Muhammad and also Adam, according to a hadith recorded in Sahih ibn Hiban from Abu Dar. Others he raised to degrees of honor, as is evident in the hadith about the Isra journey, when the Messenger of Allah saw the prophets in the various heavens according to their rank with Allah. If somebody asks about the collective meaning of this ayah, and the hadith that the two sahis collected from Abu Huraira, which states, Once a Muslim man and a Jew had an argument, and the Jew said, No, by him who gave Musa superiority over, over all human beings. Hearing him, the Muslim man raised his hand and slapped the Jew on his face and said, Over Muhammad too, O evil one. The Jew went to the Prophet and complained to him, and the Prophet said, don't give me superiority above the prophets, for the people will become unconscious on the day of resurrection, and I will be the first to be resurrected to see Musa holding on to the pillar of Allah's throne. I will not know whether the unconsciousness of Musa suffered on the day of the trumpet sufficed for him, or if he got up before me, so do not give me superiority above the prophets. In another narration, the prophet said, do not give superiority to some prophets above others. To, the answer to this question is that this hadith prohibits preferring some prophets above others in cases of dispute and argument, such as the incident mentioned in, this, in the hadith. The hadith indicates that it is not up to creation to decide which prophet is better, 
for this is Allah's decision. The creation is only required to submit to obey and believe in Allah's decision. Allah's statement. And we gave Isa, the son of Maryam, clear signs, refers to the proofs and unequivocal evidences that testify to the truth that Isa delivered to the children of Israel, thus testifying that he was Allah's servant and his messenger to them, and supported him with Ru il Kudus, meaning Allah aided Isa with Jibril, with Jibril, peace be upon him. Allah then said, if Allah had willed, succeeding generations would not have fought against each other after clear verses of Allah had come to them. But they differed. Some of them believed and others disbelieved. If Allah had willed, they would not have fought against one another, meaning all this happened by Allah's decree, and this is why he said next. But Allah does what he wills. 254. O you who believe, spend of that which spend of that with which we have provided for you before a day comes when there will be no bargaining, nor friendship, nor intercession. And it is the disbelievers who are the wrongdoers. Allah commands his servants to spend for his sake in the path of righteousness for what he has granted them, so that they acquire and kept and keep the reward of this righteous deed with their Lord and King. Let them rush to perform this deed in this life. Before a day comes, meaning the day of resurrection, when there will be no bargaining, nor friendship, nor intercession, this ayah indicates that on that day no one will be, will be able to bargain on behalf of himself or ransom himself with any amount, even if it was the earth's fill of gold, nor will his friendship or relation to anyone benefit him. Similarly, Allah said, Then, when the trumpet is blown, there will be no kin kinship, uh, there will be no kinship among them that day, nor will they ask of one another. 2301. Nor intercession, meaning they will not benefit by the intercession of anyone. Allah's statement. And it is the disbelievers who are the wrongdoers indicates that no injustice is worse than meeting Allah on that day while a disbeliever. Ibn Abi Hatim recorded that Atta bin Dinar said Ali um, Atta bin Dinar said all thanks are due to Allah who said and if and it is the disbelievers who are the wrongdoers but did not say and it is the wrongdoers who are the disbelievers. 255 Allah, none has the right to be worshipped but He, the ever-living, the one who sustains and protects all that exists. Neither slumber nor sleep overtakes Him. To Him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. Who is He that can intercede with Him except with His permission? He knows what happens to them, His creatures in this world, and what will happen to them in the hereafter. And they will never come past anything of His, of his knowledge except that which he wills. His kudsi extends over the heavens and the earth, and he feels no fatigue in guarding and preserving them, and he is the most high, the most great. The virtue of Ayat al-Kudsi. This is Ayat al-Kudsi, and tremendous virtues have been associated with it, for the authentic hadith describes it as the greatest ayah in the Book of Allah. Imam Ahmad recorded that Ubay bin Kab said that the Prophet asked him about the greatest ayah in the Book of Allah, and Ubay answered, Allah and his messenger know be better. When the Prophet repeated his question several times, Ubay said, Ayat al Kudsi, the Prophet com commented, Congratulations for having knowledge of Abu al mundhir By he in whose hand is my soul, this ayah has a tongue and two lips with which she praises the king, Allah, next to the leg of the throne. This hadith was also collected by Muslim 
but he did not include the part that starts with by he in whose hand. Imam Ahmad recorded that Abu Ayyub said that he had some dates and a ghoul used to take some. And he complained to the Prophet. The Prophet said to him, when you, when you see her say in the name of Allah, answer to the Messenger of Allah, Abu Ayyub said that when she came again, he said these words and he was able to grab her. She begged, I will not come again. So Abu Ayyub released her. Abu Ayyub went to the Prophet and the Prophet asked him, What did your prisoner do? Abu Ayyub said, I grabbed her and she said twice, I will not come again. And I released her. <laughs> the Prophet said, She will come again. She will come back. Abu Ayyub said, so I grabbed her twice or three times, yet each time I would release her when she vowed not to come back. I would go to the Prophet who would ask me, What is the news of your prisoner? I would say, I grabbed her, then released her when she said that she would not return. The Prophet would say that she would return. Once I grabbed her and she said, Release me and I will teach you something to recite so that no harm touches you. That is Ayat al-Kursi. <coughs> Abu Ayyub went to the Prophet and told him and the Prophet said she is a liar but she told the truth Al-Tirmidhi recorded this hadith in the chapter of the virtues of the Quran and said Hassan Garib in Arabic ghoul refers to the jinn when they appear at night Al-Bukhari recorded a similar story in his Sahih from Abu Huraira in the chapters on the virtues of the Quran and the description of Shaitan. In this narration, Abu Huraira said, Allah's Messenger assigned me to keep watch over the Sadaka, charity of Ramadan. A person, a person snuck in and started taking handfuls of foodstuff. I caught him and said, by Allah, I will take you to Allah's Messenger. He said, Release me, for I am meek and have many dependents, and am in great need. I released him, and in the morning Allah's Messenger asked me, What did your prisoner do yesterday, O Abu Huraira? I said, O Allah's Messenger, he complained of being needy and of having many dependents, so I pitied him and let him go. Allah's Messenger said, Indeed, he told you a lie and will be coming again. I believed that he would show up again, for Allah's Messenger had told me that he would return. So I, so I watched. I watched for him when he showed up and started stealing handfuls of foodstuff. I caught hold of him again and said, "I will definitely take you to Allah's Messenger." He said, "Leave me, for I am very needy and have." and have many dependents. I promise I will not come back again. I pitied him and let him go. In the morning Allah's messenger asked me, what did your prisoner do last night, O Abu Huraira? I replied, O Allah's messenger, he complained of his great need and of too many dependents. So I took pity on him and set him free. Allah's messenger said, verily he told you a lie, he will return. I waited for him attentively for the third time, and when he came and started stealing handfuls of the foodstuff, I caught hold of him and said, I will surely take you to Allah's messenger, as it is the third time you promised not to return, yet you returned. He said, let me teach you some words which Allah will give you benefit from. I asked, what are they? He said, he replied, whenever you go to bed, Recite Ayat al-Kursi, Allahu la ilaha, ila huwal hayul, kayum, till you finish the whole verse. If you do so, Allah will appoint a guard for you, who will stay with you, and no shaitan will come near you until morning. So I released him in the morning. Allah's Messenger asked, What did your prisoner do yesterday? 
I replied, O oh Allah's Messenger, he claimed that he would teach me some words by which Allah would grant me some benefit, so I let him go. Allah's Messenger asked, What are they? I replied, He said to me, Whenever you go to bed, recite Ayat al Kursi from the beginning to the end. Allah hu la illaha illa huval hayul kayum. He further said to me, If you do so, Allah will appoint a guard for you who will stay with you, and no shaitan will come near you until morning. One of the narrators then commented that they, their companions, were very keen to do good deeds. The Prophet said, he spoke the truth, although he is a liar. Do you know whom you were talking to? These three knights, O Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira said, No. He said, It was Shaitan. An Nasai also recorded this hadith in Al Yawm wa Al Layla. Allah's greatest name in Allah's greatest name is in Ayat Al Kursi. Imam Ahmad recorded that Asma bint Yasid bin As Sakan said, I heard the Messenger of Allah say about these two ayat. <laughs> Allah, none has the right to be worshipped but He, the ever living, the one who sustains and protects all that exists. 2 255 and Alif Lam Mim. Allah, none has the right to be worshipped but He, the ever living, the one who sustains and protects all that exists. 3, 1 and 2. They contain Allah's greatest name. This is also the narration collected by Abu Dawud, At-Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah. And At-Tirmidhi said, Hassan Sahih. Further, Ibn Marduvia recorded that Abu Umama reported that the Prophet said, Allah's greatest name, if he was supplicated with it, he answers the supplication, is in three surahs, Al-Baqarah, Al-Imran, and Taha. Hisham bin Ahmad, the Khatib, or orator of Damascus, one of the narrators in the above narration said, as for Al-Baqarah, it is in Allah, none has the right to be worshipped but he, the ever-living, the one who sustains and protects all that exists. 2. 255. In Al-Imran, it is in Alif, Lam, Mim. Allah, none has the right to be worshipped but He, the ever living, the one who sustains and protects all that exists. 3, 1 and 2. While in Taha it is in, and all faces shall be humbled before Allah, the ever living, the one who sustains and protects all that exists. 20, 111. Ayat al-Kursi has 10 complete Arabic sentences. 1. Allah's statement. Allah, none has the right to be worshipped, but He mentions that Allah is the one and only Lord of all creation. 2. Allah's statement. al hayul Kayyum testifies that Allah is the ever-living, who never dies, who sustains everyone and everything. All creation stands in need of Allah and totally relies on Him, while He is the most rich, who stands in need of nothing created. Similarly, Allah said, And among His signs is that the heaven and the earth stand by His command. 30.25 3. Allah's Statement Neither slumber nor sleep overtakes him, means no shortcoming, unawareness or ignorance ever touches Allah, rather he is aware of and controls what every soul earns, has perfect, wa has perfect watch over everything. Nothing escapes his knowledge and no secret matter is secret to him. Among his perfect attributes is the fact that he is never affected by slumber or sleep. Therefore, Allah's statement. Neither slumber overtakes him indicates that no unawareness due to slumber ever overtakes Allah. 
Allah said afterwards nor sleep which is stronger than slumber it is recorded in the Sahih that Abu Musa said the messenger of Allah delivered a speech regarding four words Allah does not sleep and it does not befit his majesty that he sleeps he lowers the scales and raises them the deeds of the day are resurrected in front of him before the deeds of the night and the deeds of the night before the deeds of the day his will is light or fire and if he removes it the rays from his face would burn whatever his sight reaches of his creation for Allah's statement to him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth indicates that everyone is a servant of for Allah a part of his kingdom and under his power and authority similarly Allah said there is none in the heavens and the earth but comes unto the most gracious Allah as a servant verily he knows each one of them and has counted them a full counting and every one of them will come to him alone on the day of resurrection without any helper or protector or defender 19 93 and 95 5 Allah's statement who is he that can intercede with him except with his permission is similar to his statements and there are many angels in the heavens whose intercession will avail nothing except after Allah has given leave for whom he wills and is pleased with 53 26 and they cannot intercede except for him with whom he is pleased 21 28 these ayat assert Allah's greatness pride and grace and that no one dares to intercede with him on behalf of anyone else except by his permission indeed the hadith about the intercession states that the prophet said I will stand under the throne and fall in prostration and Allah will allow me to remain in that position as much as he wills I will thereafter be told raise your head speak and you will be heard intercede and your intercession will be accepted the prophet then said he will allow me a proportion whom I will enter into paradise 6 Allah's statement he knows what happens to them his creatures in this world and what will happen to them in the hereafter this refers to his perfect knowledge of all creation its past present and future similarly Allah said that the angels proclaimed and we angels descend not except by the command of your Lord O Muhammad to him belongs what is before us and what is behind us and what is between those two and your Lord is never forgetful 1964 7 Allah's statement and they will never encompass anything of his knowledge except that which he wills asserts the fact that no one attains any part of Allah's knowledge except what Allah conveys and allows this part of the ayah indicates that no one ever acquires knowledge of Allah and in his attributes except what he conveys to them for instance Allah said but they will never compass anything of his knowledge 20 110 8 Allah said his courtesy extends over the heavens and the earth Vaki narrated in his tafsir that Ibn Abbas said Kursi is the footstool and no one is able to give due consideration to Allah's throne Al-Hakim recorded this hadith in his Mustadrak from Ibn Abbas who did not relate it to the Prophet Al-Hakim said it is Sahih according to the criteria of the two Sahihs and they Al-Bukhari and Muslim did not record it in addition al dahak said that Ibn Abbas said if the seven heavens and the seven earths were flattened and laid, a, and laid side by side they would add up to the size of a ring in a desert compared to the Qudsi 9 Allah said and he feels no fatigue in guarding and preserving them meaning it does not burden or cause him fatigue to protect the heavens and earth and all that is that is in between them rather this is an easy matter for him 
Further, Allah sustains everything, has perfect watch over everything, nothing ever escapes his knowledge, and no matter is ever a secret to him. All matters are insignificant, modest, and humble before him. He is the most rich, worthy of all praise. He does what he wills, and no one can ask him about what he does. While they will be asked, he has supreme power over all things and perfect alertness concerning everything. He is the most high, the greatest, there is no deity worthy of worship except him, and no lord other than him. 10. Allah's statement. And he is the most high, the most great, is similar to his statement. The most great, the most high. 13. 9. These and similar ayat and authentic hadiths about Allah's attributes must be treated the way the Salaf, righteous ancestors, treated them by accepting their apparent meanings without equating them with, with the attributes of the creation or altering their apparent meanings. 256. There is no compulsion in religion. Verily, the right path has become distinct from the wrong path. Whoever disbelieves in Taghut and believes in Allah, then he has grasped the most trustworthy handhold that will never break. And Allah is all hearer, all knower. No compulsion in religion. Allah said, There is no compulsion in religion, meaning do not force anyone to become Muslim. For Islam is plain and clear, and its proofs and evidence are plain and clear. Therefore, there is no need to force anyone to embrace Islam. Rather, whoever Allah directs to Islam, opens his heart for it, and enlightens his mind, will embrace Islam with certainty. Whoever Allah blinds his heart and seals his hearing and sight, then he will not benefit from being forced to embrace Islam. It was reported that the Ansar were the reason behind revealing this ayah, although its indication is general in meaning. Ibn Jarir recorded that Ibn Abbas said that before Islam, when an Ansar woman would not bear children who would live, she would vow that if she gives birth to a child who remains alive, she would raise him as a Jew when Banu al Nadir, the Jewish tribe, were evacuated from Al Madina. Some of the children of the Ansar were being raised among them. And the Ansar said, We will not abandon our children. Allah revealed, There is no compulsion in religion. Verily, the right path has become distinct from the wrong path. Abu Dawud and Al Nasai also recorded this hadith. As for the hadith that Imam Ahmad recorded, in which Al Nas said that the Messenger of Allah said to a man, Embrace Islam. The man said, I dislike it. The Prophet said, Even if you dislike it, First, this is an authentic hadith with only three narrators between Imam Ahmad and the Prophet. However, it is not relevant to the subject under, the, under discussion, for the Prophet did not force that man to become Muslim. The Prophet merely invited this man to become Muslim, and he replied that he does not find himself eager to become Muslim. The Prophet said to the man that even though he dislikes embracing Islam, he should still embrace it. For Allah will grant you sincerity and true intent. Tawheed is the most trustworthy handhold. Allah's statement. Whoever disbelieves in Taghut and believes in Allah, then he has grasped the most trustworthy handhold that will never break. And Allah is all hearer, all knower. Is in reference to whoever shuns the rivals of Allah, the idols, and those that shaitan calls to be worshipped besides Allah, Whoever believes in Allah's oneness, worship him alone, and testifies that there is no deity worthy of worship except him, then, then he has grasped the most trustworthy handhold. Therefore, this person will have acquired firmness in the religion, and proceeded on the correct way and the straight path. Abu al-Qasim al-Baghavi recorded that Umar said, Jibt means magic, and Taghut means shaitan. 
Verily, courage and cowardice are two instincts that appear in man. The courageous fight for those whom he does not know, and the coward runs away from defending his own mother. Man's honor resides with his religion, and his status is based upon his character, even if he was Persian or Nabatian. Umar's statement that Taghut is Shaitan is very sound. For this meaning includes every type of evil that the ignorant people of Jahiliya, pre-Islamic era of ignorance, fell into, such as worshipping idols, referring to them for judgment and invoking them for victory. Allah's statement. Then he has grasped the most trustworthy handhold that will never break means he will have hold of the true religion with the strongest grasp. Allah equated this adherence to the firm handhold that never breaks because it is built solid and because its handle is firmly connected. This is why Allah said here, then he has grasped the most trustworthy handhold that will never break. Mujahid said, the most trustworthy handled is Iman, fate. Asudi said that it refers to Islam. Imam Ahmad recorded that Qais bin Abad said, I was in the Majid when a man whose face showed signs of hum humbleness came and prayed two rakahs that were modest in length. The people said, this is a man from among the people of paradise. When he left, I followed him until he entered his house, and I entered it after him and spoke with him. When he felt at ease, I said to him, when you entered the Majid, the people said such and such things. He said, all praise is due to Allah. No one should say what he has no knowledge of. I will tell you why they said that. I saw a vision during the time of the messenger of Allah, and I narrated it to him. I saw that uh, I was in a green garden, and he described the garden's plants and spaciousness, and there was an iron pole in the middle of the garden, affixed in the earth, and its tip reached the sky. On its tip there was a handle, and I was told to ascend the pole. I said, I cannot. Then a helper came and raised my robe from behind and said to me, Ascend. I ascended until I grasped the, ha the handle, and, s and he said to me, Hold on to the handle. I awoke from that dream with the handle in my hand. I went to the messenger of Allah and told him about the vision and he said, As for the garden, it re represents Islam. As for the pole, it represents the pillar. It represents the pillar of Islam. And the handle represents the most trustworthy handhold. You shall remain Muslim until you die. This companion was Abdullah bin Salam. This hadith was also collected in the two Sahis and Al-Bukhari also recorded it with another chain of narration. 257. Allah is the Wali, protector or guardian, of those who believe. He brings them out from darknesses into light, but as for those who disbelieve, their avliya, supporters and helpers are taghut, false deities and false leaders. They bring them out from light into darknesses. Those are the dwellers of the fire and they will abide therein forever. Allah stated that whoever follows, follows what pleases him, he will guide him to the paths of peace, that is Islam, or paradise. Verily, Allah delivers his believing servants from the darkness of disbelief, doubt, and hesitation to the light of the plain, clear, explained, easy, and unequivoc unequivocal truth. He also stated that shaitan is a supporter of the disbelievers who beautifies the paths of ignorance and misguidance that they follow, thus causing them to deviate from the true path into disbelief and wickedness. Those are the dwellers of the fire, and they will abide therein forever. This is why Allah mentioned the light in the singular while mentioned the darkness in the plural, because, the, because truth is one, while disbelief comes as several types all of which are false. 
Similarly, Allah said, And verily, this is my straight path, so follow it, and follow not other paths, for they will separate you away from his path. This is... Um, this he has ordained for you, that you may have taqwa, 653, and originated the darknesses and the light, 61, and to the right and to the left, 1648. There are many other ayat on the subject that mention the truth in the singular and falsehood in the plural, because of falsehood's many divisions and branches. <laughs> 258. Have you not looked at him who disputed with Ibrahim about his Lord Allah, because Allah had given him the kingdom when Ibrahim said to him, My Lord is he who gives life and causes death. He said, I give life and cause death. Ibrahim said, Verily, Allah brings the sun from the east, then brings it you from the west, then bring it you from the west. So the disbeliever was utterly defeated and Allah guides not the people who are wrongdoers. <laughs> the debate between Ibrahim al-Khalil and King Nimrod. The king who disputed with Ibrahim was King Nimrod, son of Canaan, son of Cush, son of Sam, son of Noah, as Mujahid stated. It was also said that he was Nimrod, son of Falik, son of Abir, son of Shalik, son of Arfakshand, son of Sam, son of Noah, Mujahid said, the kings who rule the eastern and western parts of the world are four, two believers and two disbelievers. As for the two believing kings, they were Sulaiman bin Davud and Dul Qarnayn. As for the two disbelieving kings, they were Nimrod and Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, Allah knows best. Allah said, Have you not looked, meaning with your heart, O Muhammad, at him who disputed with Ibrahim about his Lord, meaning about the existence of Allah? Nimrod denied the existence of a God other than himself, as he claimed, just as Firan said later to his people, I know not that you have a God other than me. 28, 38. What made Nimrod commit this transgression, utter disbelief and errant rebellion, was his tyranny and the fact that he ruled for a long time. This is why the ayah continued. Because Allah had given him the kingdom, it appears that Nimrod asked Ibrahim to produce proof that Allah exists. Ibrahim replied, My Lord is he who gives life and causes death meaning the proof of Allah's existence is the creations that exist after they were nothing and perish after they had existed. This only proves the existence of the Creator, who does what He wills, for these things could not have occurred on their own without the Creator who created them, and He is the Lord that I call to for worship, alone without, part without a partner. This is when Nimrod said, I give life and cause death. Qatada, Muhammad bin Ishaq and As-Sudi said that he meant two men who deserved execution were to be brought before me and I would command that one of them be killed and he will be killed. I would command that the second man be pardoned and he will be pardoned. This is how I bring life and death. However, it appears that since Nimrod did not deny the existence of a creator, his statement did not mean what Qatada said it meant. This explanation does not provide an answer to what Ibrahim said. Nimrod ar arrogantly and defiantly claimed that he was the creator and pretended that it was he who brings life and death. Later on, Firam imitated him and announced, I know not that you have a god other than me. 28.38 This is why Ibrahim said to Nimrod, Verily, Allah brings the sun from the east. Then, brings it to, then, bring, then bring it to you from the west. This ayah means, you claim that it is you who brings life and death. He who brings life and death controls the existence and creates whatever is in it, including controlling its planets and their movements. For instance, the sun rises every day from the east. Therefore, if you were God, as you claimed, 
bringing life and death, then bring the sun from the west, since the king was aware of his weakness, in inadequacy, and that he was not able to reply to Ibrahim's request, he was idle, silent, and unable to comment. Therefore, the proof was established against him. Allah said, And Allah guides not the people who are wrongdoers, meaning, Allah deprives the unjust people of any valid proof or argument. Furthermore, their false proof and arguments are annulled by their Lord, and they have earned his anger and will suffer severe torment. The meaning that we provided is better than the meaning that some philosophers offered, claiming that Ibrahim used the second argument because it was clearer than the first one. Rather, our explanation asserts that Ibrahim refuted both claims of Nimrod, all praises due to Allah. Asudi stated that the debate between Ibrahim and Nimrod occurred after Ibrahim was thrown in the fire. For Ibrahim did not meet the king before that day. 259. Or like the one who passed by a town in ruin up to its roofs, he said, How will Allah ever bring it to life after its death? So Allah caused him to die for a hundred years, then raised him up. Again, he said, How long did you remain dead? He, the man, said, Perhaps I remained dead a day or part of a day? He said, Nay, you have remained dead for a hundred years. Look at your food and your drink. They show no change. And look at your donkey. And thus we have made of you a sign for the people. Look at the bones. How we bring them together and clothe them with flesh. When this was clearly shown to him, he said, I know now that Allah is able to do, to do all things. The story of Usaid, Allah's statement, Have you not looked at him who disputed with Ibrahim about his Lord? Means, have you seen anyone like the person who disputed with Ibrahim about his Lord? Then Allah connected the ayah, or like the one who passed by a town in ruin up to its roofs, to the ayah above by using, or Ibn Abi Hatim recorded that Ali bin Abi Talib said that the ayah 2.259 meant Usaid bin Usaid Ibn Jarir also reported it, and this explanation was also reported by Ibn Jarir and Ibn Abi Hatim from Ibn Abbas, Al Hasan, Qatada, Asudi, and Sulaiman bin Bureyda. Mujahid bin Jabed said that the ayah refers to a man from the children of Israel, and the village was Jerusalem, after Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it and killed its people. In ruin means it became it became empty of people. Allah's statement up to its roofs indicates that the roofs and walls of the village fell to the ground. Usair stood contemplating about what had happened to that city after a great civilization used to inhabit it. He said, Oh, how will Allah ever bring it to life after its death? Because of the utter destruction he saw and the implausibility of its returning to what it used to be. Allah said. So Allah caused him to die for a hundred years, then raised him up again. The city was rebuilt seventy years after the man Usair died, and its inhabitants increased and the children of Israel moved back to it. When Allah resurrected Usair after he died, the first organ that he resurrected were his eyes, so that he could witness that Allah does what so that he could witness what Allah does with him, how he brings his how he brings life back to his body. When his resurrection was complete, Allah said to him, meaning through the angel, How long did you remain dead? He the man said, Perhaps I remained dead a day or part of a day. The scholars said that since the man died in the early part of the day, and Allah resurrected him in the latter part of the day, when he saw that the that the sun was still apparent. He thought that it was the sun of that very day, he said. <laughs> or part of a day, he said, Nay, you have remained dead for a hundred years. Look at your food and your drink. They show no change. He had grapes, figs and juice. 
and he found them as he left them. Neither did the juice spoil, nor the figs become bitter, nor the grapes rot. And look at your donkey, how Allah brings it back to life while you are watching. And thus we have made of you a sign for the people that resurrection occurs. Look at the bones, how we nunshi suha, meaning collect them and put them back together. In his Mustadrak, Al-Hakim recorded that Karija bin Said bin Fabit said that his father said that the Messenger of Allah read this ayah. Hawi Nunshi Suha Al-Hakim said its chain is Sahih and they Al-Bukhari and Muslim did not record it. The ayah was also read. Nunshi Nunshi Ruha meaning bring them back to life as Mujahid stated and clothe them with flesh. Al-Sudi said Usaid observed the bones of his donkey which were scattered all around him to his right and left and Allah sent a wind that collected the bones from all over the area. Allah then brought every bone to its place until they formed a full donkey made of fleshless bones. Allah then covered these bones with flesh, nerves, veins and skin. Allah sent an angel who blew life in the donkey's nostrils and the donkey started to bray by Allah's leave. All, all this occurred while Usaid was watching and this is when he proclaimed. He said, I know now that Allah is able to do all things, meaning I know that and I did witness it with my own eyes. Therefore, I am the most knowledgeable in this matter among the people of my time. 260. And remember when Ibrahim said, My Lord, show me how you give life to the dead. He, Allah said, Do you not believe? He, Ibrahim said, Yes, I believe, but to be stronger in faith. He said, Take your birds, then cause them to incline towards you then slaughter them, cut them into pieces, and then put a portion of them on every hill and call them, they will come to you in haste, and know that Allah is almighty, all wise. <laughs>